President Bola Tinubu has urged leaders of the economic community of West African states to re-engage with countries in the sub-region whose democratic governments were ousted in military coups to agree on a realistic and short transition plan for them. He reiterated that this position as he opened the 64th Ordinary Session of the ECOWAS Authority of Heads of State and Government on Sunday. The president emphasized the need to further strengthen regional democratic achievements and uphold the right of the people to elect the leaders of their choice. Recall that there has been tension in these countries where threats of military intervention has taken place with many fleeing for safety. TBC News correspondent Moyo Lawal Moyo Thomas has details. After about three hours closed door meeting, the ECOWAS Authority of Heads of State and Government have finally reached a decision on matters perceived important to consolidating democracy and good governance in the region. The meeting highlights how the disturbing trend of coup and coup attempt in the region has posed a great threat to its sustainability. The authority rejects all forms of alliances that seek to divide the region and promote foreign interests in the region. The presidents of the ECOWAS Commission who read the communicator contained some of the decisions of the authority says it is extending the mandate of its mission in Gambia and Guinea-Bissau to ensure stability. It also took a decision on Liberia's election and Sierra Leone's crisis. The authority further decides to extend the mandate of the ECOWAS Stabilization Support Mission in Guinea-Bissau. On Sierra Leone, the authority strongly condemns the attempted coup d'etat of 26 November 2023. It further directs the Commission to facilitate the deployment of an ECOWAS, standby, ECOWAS security mission to Sierra Leone to help stabilize the country. On the fight against terrorism and security issues, the authority instructs the Commission to urgently review efforts to activate the ECOWAS standby force to counter terrorism. It instructs the Commission to expedite the convening of the meeting of Ministers of Finance and Defense to agree on the modalities for the mobilization of internal financial, human and material resources on a mandatory basis to support the deployment of the regional counter-terrorism force. The authority wants an immediate and unconditional release of President Bazoum of Niger and has to this effect set up a committee of heads of state of Togo, Benin and Sierra Leone. To engage with CNSP and other stakeholders with a view to agreeing on a short transition roadmap establishing transition organs as well as facilitating the setting up of a transition monitoring and evaluation mechanism towards the speedy restoration of constitutional order. Outcome of the engagement with the committee, according to the authority, will determine if the sanctions on Niger will be eased. If not, the authority insists on upholding all sanctions, including the use of force. As the session closes, the decision of the authority of heads of state and government is for the Committee on Peace and Transition Talk to start work immediately in meeting with the military administrators, but a time frame was not given for when this is to be concluded. Moya Thomas, TVC News, Abuja. Joining us via Zoom from Abuja is Dr. Uluole Ojewale, security expert and regional coordinator for Central Africa at the Institute for Security Studies in Dakar, Senegal. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. When you look at the resolutions reached by the ECOWAS heads of state or leaders, uh, does it go to show that uh, the leaders no longer want to uh, look at the use of force, but perhaps just want to dialogue to restore uh, some level of uh, constitutional order back to the country? Yes, that is the sense that uh, we get from that resolution of the 64th Ordinary Session of the ECOWAS head of state. And I think it is in order because this is what some of us have also campaigned for, that uh, you can't necessarily use force to quell force. And then that is going to be a zero-sum game. So I think the, uh, the voices of reason are finally prevail. And it is, the best, it is in the best interest of the region. And I think it's the most rational thinking that we can have around this now. And we can say authoritatively, based on the reading of events, that... Uh, Military option is completely off the table. 
Mm. Well, President Tinubu had suggested nine months transition, you know, uh, for Niger Junta. He also said some months back that Nigeria returned to civilian rule in, you know, this period of nine months in 1999, uh, where which instituted by the former military uh, head of state, General Abdullah Mubarak, who also, you know, headed the delegation to Niger to meet with the, the, the Junta. Uh, so, but the coup is really wanted three-year transition plan. How do you think the ECOWAS can, you know, uh, can move around this to ensure that there is constitutional, there is restoration of constitutional order as against the saber rattling which the echo has, you know, uh, popped up the other time? Well, I think the context are different. If the president said, I mean, made reference to the case of Nigeria, don't forget that he's also part of the struggle, and that started as early as 1993. So a longer history of that will show that it took about six years before democracy finally came to Nigeria, I mean, came back to Nigeria. So I think both parties are going to find a midpoint, and that midpoint is going to hover around 18 months to 24 months. That is the most uh, realistic uh, thinking around that now. And the second thing is that you also need to know that we, are, we now have a long coup bed, starting from Guinea up to Niger, and then whatever you apply in one situation, you also have to generalize in another. So there's no way that Niger can suddenly become the center of conversation around this. Whatever they are discussing, we also extend to Burkina Faso and Mali. And I'm fully aware, based on ECOWAS, uh, my interaction with ECOWAS before that, uh, ECOWAS had already set a timeline of uh, the end of 2024 for each of them. But the way and manner in which countries like Mali are now shifting goalposts and touching election in 2024, and Burkina Faso nearly silent about election and talking about issues of insecurity. It's also going to rub on Niger. And don't forget that these three countries are now talking to each other. Mm. So for me, um, I think it's commendable that ECOWAS have, soft, I mean, have uh, provided that means of um, robust international dialogue between these countries. But what looks reasonable and maybe that can be achievable within the shortest time period is going to be like around 18 months. But are you concerned that uh, with uh, the seeming alliance that Niger now has with Mali and Burkina Faso, that uh, this conversation that ECOWAS is pushing may not achieve much because uh, these three countries are seriously pushing for what they call alliance of uh, Sahel states and they are looking like they are not going to break the squad uh, that they are putting together as it is. There's so much concern. ECOWAS has said that this is just a distraction, but do you see it as that? It's a military decoy and it's a distraction to take off what is the most urgent issue of transition of the table. But as much as I'm concerned, I also know that they, fully, uh, they are fully aware that they are living on borrowed time. Um, whether they allow transition to come peacefully or maybe they want to prolong it, at some point it is their people that are going to rise against them. It's not going to be forever. And no matter the Liktako Goma Charter Agreement that they've come up and everything, those things are not yielding results in those countries. There are people who have gone to the street to say um, democracy that is not putting food on the table is not a democracy. And the question is that uh, when you now look at those countries now, what improvement have we seen in health, in agriculture, in education, in infrastructure development? And the most germane one that is a major challenge to the region, which is insecurity, has deteriorated further in the last two years. So the longer they stay, the, more hard, uh, the, the, the harder it becomes for them and the people. And at some time, probably they are going to suffer insurrection, maybe within the army or the people will revolt against them. So it is in their own interest and in the interest of the entire region to cooperate with ECOWAS, most especially now that ECOWAS is now um, toning down on military invasion and engaging with them in dialogue. I think that is the best way to go. And those agreements and arrangements that they are putting together to maybe fract uh, fracture ECOWAS for that, I don't think it's going to stand the test of time. ECOWAS is stronger than them, and the fact that ECOWAS is probably toning down on the issue of military invasion uh, is a symbol of strength. It mustn't be seen as a symbol of weakness that maybe ECOWAS is incapable of carrying out those operations. It is just that in the larger interest and humanitarian concern that will be the potential consequence of that, that is the reason why ECOWAS is following the path of peace. And it is also in their own interest to also embrace that. Um, um, 
uh, facilitate quick, uh, quick transition plan. Well, during the time the coup is actually took over uh, the, uh, the power um, put in, in Niger, we saw people who went to the streets, you know, giving rallying support for the, the junta. And then they, they said that they actually, that is what they wanted, and they wanted a better country. Now you are leading to the fact that they are really under the impact of terrorism, insecurity, food insecurity, etc. Uh, do you feel that the people are caught up, you know, they are within the deep blue sea, the devil and the deep blue sea? Is it possible that you feel that they might actually, you know, rouse against the, the junta themselves? They will. And it, that, that is the reason why I met, I'm, I'm, I met people from Niger, Guinea, and all these places in conferences. And I can tell you authoritatively from the evidence that I've gotten from them, the sanctions are biting harder, particularly in Niger now. Seriously biting. They are complaining they couldn't, and they couldn't access medical facilities, um, and medical um, uh, drugs, and all those things. Basic things, you know, these are landlocked countries. They depend on imports uh, from the littoral state of Ghana, Nigeria, and other, 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 other countries along the coast. So economically, the, the, the sanctions are biting harder on them. And whether the, the, uh, the copies like it or not, at some point, there's going to, they have to give way for transition plan to be implemented in those countries. So, and the people that you saw carrying placard on the, uh, on, the, on the day of the coup and all those things, um, they are mostly people that are recruited, maybe giving some money. In the real sense of it, based on Afrobarometer data and every indicators, the people are satisfied with them. The people embrace democracy. Let me be careful with my word. And that is what they actually want. And whether they, 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 they come out or they, 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 they um, to protest in support of uh, who or not, the only move for coup ended 24 hours after the coup was staged. Uh, any, anything from that, any, anything apart from that is a biting reality for the people. And we cannot begin to maybe sing or discuss, and that is what you see in the day, discussing military authoritarianism as an alternative democracy, to democracy. No. What separates military authoritarianism from democracy as civil liberty? We can now come up with a minimalist uh, conceptualization of democracy as a, a, about people eating food. And, um, don't, no, no, it's beyond that. Mm -hmm. So the important thing is that uh, people have the right to select their leaders as containing the constitution of the land and its <coughs> national protocols on good governance. And that is what must prevail. People can't come through the barrel of the gun. That is the real deal now in those countries. No matter what, I mean civil society from Mali and all those places, they are complaining, the government is gagging them, they can't talk anything you say in Mali now, you are targeted and uh, I'm, I'm profiled as pro-France. Somebody did a TikTok in Mar by Bamako, a woman complained about uh, uh, ad life, and then they suddenly turned her to a pro-France uh, uh, protester in the country. That is the situation in those countries. People need to come back and realize that uh, this is not an alternative to, to democracy. It's a different system entirely that is not serving the purpose of governance in the 21st century. But how much liberty has uh, democracy brought for those people? Has it liberated them from poverty and all of the struggles that they have known before the military now took over to mention some of the things that you are talking about? And recall that the president, uh, actually that's President Bola Tinubu, mentioned that there has to be an improvement on good government and respect for human rights and the rule of law. If that was there, I don't think he will be mentioning this. Well, I think he just spoke about that uh, generally about what should be the objective of democracy, what should be the, 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 the unique features of democracy that people must experience. I'm talking to you this morning about these things because I have the liberty to talk. People don't have that liberty in Mali. People don't have that liberty in Burkina Faso. They don't have that liberty in Niger. And you, we can't, like I said, it, it, democracy is all a compassion. It must deliver good governance and must guarantee the right of the people. Absolutely. But in those countries now, they, uh, they, we can't say that they are enjoying any of those things. Good governance is far from them. People are not secure. And then they can't also talk. They can't also assemble. Those things are taken away from them. The honeymoon ended 24 hours school was staged in those countries. So uh, and to the question you asked about how much of that were they enjoyed before, I think the reality is, is up. I mean, the jury is out in those countries now. Our security has deteriorated, governance has deteriorated because the military regime is only con I mean, concerned about regime protection in those countries. 
Mm. Well, President Tinubu mentions the imperative of re-engaging with countries under uh, military rule based on realistic transition plans. I, I would like you to explain it for us or help us talk about these, you know, the key elements of these transition plans and what would you suggest would be the ways to achieving this, uh, you know, this, this goal? Well, I think the first thing is that uh, ECOWAS must um, also try to ameliorate the impact of the sanction in those countries. Because um, some people that I spoke to in Niger, uh, they also complain seriously about that, that the coup has happened, that we are the ones that are actually experiencing the hard, the hard realities of this sanction. A more targeted sanction should be towards those people who actually state the coup and their collaborators, not really punishing the people. So if that happens in that country, then the people can now begin to see the light and then begin to reassess the situation and then also have a, a better approach and understanding in terms of relationship with the ECOWAS. The ECOWAS, the perception of people in, in, in those regions now is that ECOWAS is imposing hardship on them. So rather than them really seeing the military as a problem to them, they are seeing ECOWAS as a problem. That is the reality. And I think the second point for ECOWAS to do is actually to go into those countries and not rely on ESA and carry out and obtain data, gather evidence, as touching out the people want the transition to go so that they don't impose their own idea on the people. That is very, very important. And I think it's also a requirement in democratic engagement. And to go about that, ECOWAS also need to engage the civil society in those countries. They are the ones who are the vanguard, who are the forefront, and who can also engage with the transition money and the transition committee in those countries. It is very, very, very important. What we've seen in some of those countries is that the, the, the military is ostracizing the um, CSO uh, out of those transitions. And the whole idea is for them to develop what they want. For instance, in Mali, I'm aware that the transition plan in Mali um, the military has been able to eject into the tra transition constitution to, in a way that they've granted amnesty to the coupies so that they can also put themselves on the ballot. These mm -hmm. are things that uh, ECOWAS need to put their legs on the ground and work with the civil society so that they can actually achieve a transition plan that, uh, that, that serve the purpose, that serve the people and not serve the interest of the military authoritarians in those countries. So I think those are the vital issues now. But the starting point in each of those countries is that ECOWAS must relax the sanction now so that the people can find safe and in ECOWAS and begin to reassess their engagement with ECOWAS. And the, all this <coughs> perception about the hardship being imposed by ECOWAS can be removed. It's very, very important. That is the feeling that we get when we talk to the people in those countries. Right. Earlier you mentioned ECOWAS is stronger than these people, talking about Niger, uh, Mali, and as well as Burkina Faso, so to speak, and also the Kupist, so to speak. And I am wondering if we are forgetting uh, the international influence, talking about Russia and China. If you say ECOWAS is stronger than them, how do you mean, and how, how should ECOWAS deal with these influences who are seemingly showing interest in these countries? Well, the two countries that you mentioned, one, China's operation in Africa, they are playbook, you know, they don't interfere with political development in any country. As long as they can get their trade sorted, they, China doesn't get involved in that. And then the case of Putin and Wagner, even Putin himself in this is a serious street now, in the sense that he needed to go and be looking for harms in North Korea, in Iran, and all these places to prosecute his operations in Ukraine. That tells you that there's a little in which Putin can help the three of them. That is just the reality. So you can't base your, they can't base the assessment on reliance on Putin's support to prosecute war. And like I said, it's going to be a zero-sum game. The fact that ECOWAS is following the path of peace and not the path of military invasion doesn't mean, based on my own personal assessment, that ECOWAS is incapable. But, you know, you assess everything based on information at your disposal, and you look at the potential outcomes of military invasion in Niger. I was on this channel, a lot of people were also here, we're shouting and campaigning against military invasion. And I think it's a victory for democracy, really, because it's the people that are going to feel the bite of, of military invasion in the country. And then you created a situation in which the whole place become more ungovernable. A new set of rebels 
added to the new, I mean, to the whole layers of terrorism and violent extremism in the region. And Nigeria and all these other countries will no longer become safe because of um, potential fallout of all these things that I've uh, discussed. So um, much has uh, maybe those countries might be um, carry the influence of Russia and China. I don't think that is the basic reason why ECOWAS is going in other direction. ECOWAS is following a path of peace because um, a, a military invasion in the in the region is probably going to be zero sum game. And even Nigeria, that is the big boy in the in the block, we also have our own internal security challenges at hand. So mm -hmm. you don't want to go and start a new military operation in such um, region that is already convoluted already. So for me, this is my humble assessment. That ECOWAS is doing this part doesn't mean a sign of weakness. I think it's just a sign of strength and maturity. I'm finding a better way to resolve uh, a, a basic uh, political crisis, not necessarily going through the barrel of God. Well, you alluded to the fact that um, the ECOWAS is also exploring possibilities of getting these you know, junta, uh, the juntas into you know moving from uniform to get in, positioning themselves for the ballot. No, I didn't say that. I said the transition plan that those military guys are putting together, particularly in Mali, the guy wants to put himself on the ballot. That's right. So I, I just want your opinion on, on, as regards the, the fact that we've had sim a similar situation in Nigeria where we had you know, some people who moved from the uniform to the ballot and then winning elections. How do you think this will you know, pan out? Because or what, what will be your assessment of those who have moved from uni uniform to positioning themselves for, uh, for elections? Do you think they understand the, the essence of democracy or, or how to govern the state? Well, for the purpose of history, I think uh, just two persons have moved from uniform to... to, 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 to uh, uh, we're talking about General Lucia Gombasanjo and uh, General Muhammad Rubuari here and they were democratically elected. Uh, the only person who attended that, it wasn't a successful arrangement. So uh, for me, if that becomes successful in Mali, that somebody hijacked the government through the barrel of gun and put himself on the ballot, I think that is going to be setting a bad template for the region, which ECOWAS must resist and resist strongly. That must not be allowed to happen because what is going to happen is that Others might take you from that, cease government, uh, constitutional government, and then transition to democracy. No. Uh, uh, but that is the plan that I think these guys have in the huffing. Uh, and that is the reason why they are working together. So I, I think that is what ECOWAS need to prevent in the course of negotiation. Because now the table has been open. The president, for the first time in this 64th ordinary session, started talking about transition plan. It tells you that ECOWAS is also soft landing, if I could use that word. And the implication of that is that uh, now we are now looking for how we can have election in the shortest time possible, that the will of the people is going to be respected and prevail during election, not somebody imposing himself. Because in Burkina Faso now, uh, my, my political parties were banned. They were they're not invited to the transitional conversation that is going on in the country. So what is going to come out of that on the long run, except somebody maybe putting himself on the ballot or putting his student on the ballot? And the reason why the three of them are working together is that they want to have a common front of negotiation with ECOWAS. And then thinking because ECOWAS is probably also in a hurry to get into democracy and to get this country into democratic mode. They might probably begin to maybe shift some ground here and there. Of course, I know that is going to happen. But somebody seizing the government, I mean, seizing power through the barrel of a gun cannot suddenly and must not be allowed to transition in, uh, to put himself on the ballot. Because what you are going to have is that this is going to be the case of Yaya Jame. I'm sorry, uh, when I was talking about the history, I didn't talk about that. He's going to win the election. And when he wins the election, it's going to be a case of him imposing himself on the people, not necessarily the will of the people prevail in that situation. So I think it's very, very important that uh, ECOWAS uh, checkmate that and don't allow that to happen, particularly in the 21st century. Are you confident that uh, ECOWAS would make a headway with uh, this negotiation this time around? I'm extremely confident that ECOWAS is going to make headway. Those uh, military guys are also overwhelmed already. And they, 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 like I said, they know that... Uh, uh, they are living on borrowed time. Look at what Nigeria did in a bid to curry legitimacy of the people. They quickly run to they ran to ECOWAS court to say 
the sanction that ECOWAS imposed on the country is unconstitutional. And ECOWAS court said, even you yourself, you are not unconstitutional, we can't entertain this kind of case. So you know that the, the military authoritarians in those countries are running from pillar to post to see how they can get some compromise. See, call people in a day. People are feeling the sanction, they are feeling the impact of the sanction, seriously. The unfortunate thing is that it's not well targeted at the cool leaders themselves, but the idea is to I asked the, the question against... because uh, the Alliance of Sahel States, they are saying that uh, they are looking at evolving from a defense alliance, uh, a priori, which to evolve into an economic alliance and even much more. Although there are concerns of how this will isolate these countries from ECOWAS and every other uh, association they have been involved with, this is why I'm asking this question because of what they are looking at achieving with this alliance of Sahel states. I think it's just a political grandstanding. Um, it allows whatever they want to form, they are free. Within the ECOWAS region, we also have the Mano River region. It is allowed. Uh, uh, so whatever they want to form is within their power. What, uh, what ECOWAS is guiding against is that you can't fracture ECOWAS now, and not even in the foreseeable future. ECOWAS is guided that jealously. And to the extent to which ECOWAS is also doing that, they also want to make sure that this country have a quick transition as much as possible. So you know, whatever they are putting up, uh, I, I, I'm not going to put so much bet on it that probably is going to be a major threat to, to, if it is for economic development, they are free to go ahead. It's about one of the most right. poorest regions. So it's, co it's commendable if they have economic plan, um, a robust agenda to develop the place economically. Uh -huh. But to okay. form a parallel political block, mm. um, to challenge ECOWAS, I don't think ECOWAS is going to allow that. I okay, we'll so. leave the conversation here now, Dr. Uluwale Ojawale, security expert and uh, regional coordinator for Central Africa at the Institute for Security Studies in Dakar, Senegal. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much.